the thing we tried to do with Batman Returns was kind of broaden the canvas a little bit, you know, have more fun with Gotham City, make it bigger and more of a kind of visual extravaganza. We have the, the, basically the same parameters in that it's a caricature of a city, but we're approaching it a little more loosely and a little more fun and American. Well, I've worked with Bo on both, uh, you know, Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands, so, you know, uh, and we're doing it in L.A., so the trick was, you know, he's a great designer, so how do we change it without it becoming something different? I think he did a really good job of that. We sort of added slightly more specific New York things, but blew it up again, you know, made it wilder. Gotham City represents the old American city, kind of rotted, kind of corrupt, but full of character and life. The first one, to me, was very nostalgic. This one's more fascist. Fascist. And when you're doing a sequel, it's tough because the idea isn't fresh anymore. I mean, people have seen Gotham. We wanted to get our own style, and so we kind of came up with the concept that this was kind of an international, even though it was an American city, it was like an international style. It's kind of a generic fascist neoclassic architecture. Big, huge sculptures, almost kind of Russian, you know, in the size of the sculpture and stuff like that. It kind of gave it a real interesting sense for Gotham. Gotham means big anyway, so everything we did was sort of big. So everything, even the suit, we took out the muscular thing and made it more sculptural, sort of fit the set more a little bit. Same with the Batmobile, kept the basic shape, just changed it to kind of make it fit in with the room of Craig. This one also takes place in a icy cold environment, which would radically change any movie. By putting a blanket of snow on everything, you get a very strong black and white graphic contrast. The first thing I read was, Gotham is bathed in a blanket of pristine snow. Well, to the normal Joe, boy, what a great concept that is. But for someone like me, who's got to figure out how to put that on film, it's a nightmare. Especially when I know we're going to shoot it in the summer. So they're all right off the top, you got a problem. And then it goes from there. OK, so we'll put it, some of it on the soundstage, and we'll get foam and stuff, and you know, it goes from there. OK, folks, it would take us like three days to really chill the stages down to like 30 degrees what we needed to see the breath. And we had, we had I don't know how many tons of air conditioning on every stage. Uh, it worked as long as they would keep the stage doors closed. Sometimes they got it, sometimes they didn't get it. And then like stage 16 where we had Gotham City, it's the tallest stage in Warner Brothers. It's like 65 feet tall and there's so much volume in there. It took so much time to chill it down that you open the door for five minutes and you lose all the cold air. Where the Cobblepots live, where they first discovered their child wasn't exactly what they thought it was. That was a fun set. That was one that Bo said, let's just go all out on this set. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, but he said he just wanted to really, he said, make this fireplace as amazing as possible. One of our set designers, Richard May, has put like 300 different molds on it and, you know, moldings all over it. And it's only in it for a few seconds at the beginning of the movie, but it really kind of established a tone for the rest of the movie. In the story, he's, you know, discarded by his parents and washes up in the sewer in an old, rotting, abandoned display area within the expo. The concept was it was like an old marine land or something like that. It was an amusement park. It was abandoned. But it still held water, and this was his like little domain, his realm was here. Built a tank, and we, we thought we could just, to save money, just foam down to the floor, you know, and then up the wall, but the water was constantly getting under the foam. So we ended up building a weir wall, which is a little kind of a little dam outside to catch the water, and then that would leak, and we had another weir wall outside of that. We ended up with like four weir walls trying to hold all the water. This is gonna be good. <laughs> I think that was the most exciting 
place to work because of, of the water and electricity and just the energy that the lighting made on the water. Really, I think that that was related to expressionism, whether it was German expressionism or where it came from, but it's my attempt at doing <laughs> like a contemporary expressionistic uh, movie. I don't know what you want, but I know I can get it for you with a minimum of fuss. Catwoman undergoes a real transformation. Where she lives is a caricature of many New York apartments I have been in where they're so tiny. For instance, her apartment is really shaped like many hallways and the window, you only see half of it. He wanted to be like, she's this oppressed secretary. He wanted to give her an oppressed apartment. So he did the thing where that beam goes right through it. You know, it looks like the structure is actually oppressing her. The whole physical nature of the city is oppressing this girl. And we say, well, she's a girl, so he gave her some really bad pink color, you know, to make it even worse. Then when she undergoes her transformation, she pretty much tears the place apart and opens it up and paints it black. She's not going to take any crap anymore. She's a uh, cat woman. Bruce Wayne's mansion was kind of funny. We wanted to make it feel really big. We had the library, big Tudor mansion kind of look, where the bat symbol comes through and leaves a pattern on the wall. But the best part of that set was right next to it was the big fireplace, where we had the huge, huge firebox and the couch we had to make. It was really great, because it was kind of this undulating couch and this huge firebox. You could have parked a car inside the firebox. Ready? I think I'll take the stairs. And he opens up the Iron Maiden, and that's how he gets down into the Bat Cave. The Iron Maiden was Tim's call. He really liked the Iron Maiden. He liked that idea of getting in there, closing the doors, and down to the Bat Cave. The concept was, OK, he's in a cave, whatever, but everything's black for Batman. I mean, that's his color. So I kind of like, let's do everything like anthracite coal. Like, it was cut into a seam of coal. It's been hollowed out, and you see this bad control panel with all the instruments and stuff. And, and where the one precipice was, it was supposed to look like it's on like a butte or something, where it's just this like thing where the, the car is and everything, and, and the sides go way down infinitely. You don't, don't really know. We put like those vapor tight little cage lights, uh, so you know where the edge of this platform was. Kind of had a cool airport kind of feel to it. Yes, adulation is across the bear. God knows I know. Campaign of quarters. That was a that was a two level set. We wanted like to have like where the regular people came in. We wanted it to feel like very monochromatic, kind of like this is politics, you know, the run of the mill. You know, these guys running for mayor. Kind of did like a generic political set there. But the upstairs, up the winding circus, it changes. Oh, my name's not Penguin. It's Oswald Cobblepot. Oswald. There's somebody here to see you. That was his kind of upstairs headquarters where he kind of ran oh. everything. He had his little kind of throne chair and everything up there, kind of down and dark and creepy. And that was his world. We just made a huge undulating rooftop set. It was the extent of two stages. Even the scene where he first meets her on the rooftop, you just see all these rooftops going in the background. And we had a backing, painted backing that we'd just drag around and it would just go on forever. And it was all done in camera. It was no visual effects there. The Shrek store interior, now that was an amazing set. That was all done in kind of a deco, streamlined deco. We had to have the handrail made. It was all made of curved wood and metal. It was gorgeous. We did it kind of in an old, timeless 40s, 50s. We had the old Huxley style letters for all the different departments. That's when we had the big New Year's Eve ceremony or whatever it was. I'd offer you coffee, but my assistant is using a vacation time. And then we had this big conference room at the very top with this great surround, again, of buildings and backings. We had these special chairs made in this gorgeous round table. That was quite a set. The Shrek store was probably the second biggest set in the movie. Of course, we had that had to tie into the exterior that was on stage 16, which was the exterior of the Shrek store. Goodbye, my unintended. Go to heaven. 
Ugh. I think we went a little darker in the, the second one, which maybe some people were surprised by, but you know, looking back, I think it makes it a great movie in many ways. It's hard for me to describe these things with words. You know, you sit down and you, you draw pictures, you build models, and something feels right, and you do it. And you know, in my working with Tim, you sort of mutter a few things, but basically it's, it's a visual medium and you create the image until it's right. That was a very hard movie to do. I thought we pulled it off and I thought it looked great. It was that kind of a show. It was like a big bucking bull, you know, and you're just trying to ride it until your eight seconds is up and you can get off.